Well, I'm so excited to be with you, and here you are with me in my living room. What a privilege to have you with me, and what a privilege it is for me to be with you. Thank God for this honor. We've been talking about At the Cross, and today we continue with part three, and I am so excited about this message today. I'm telling you, I'm coming unglued. I'm so excited about having the privilege of being able to deliver this word to you about nothing but the blood. But for a quick review, let's just go to part one. Remember? Remember, we talked about in part one how that Christ going to the cross redeemed us from the curse, turning the curse into a blessing. That's what part one one was all about. And in part two, we talked about the passion of the Christ, the very Easter message where Jesus not only died for us, but he is risen. He's alive. And that's what makes our Savior such a king of all kings. Thank God for that. You know, the resurrection of Jesus is is proof positive that he solved the sin problem. I'm going to say that again. The resurrection of Jesus is proof positive that my master, your king, solved the sin problem. You know, there was a teacher. This was down in the southern states, and there was a teacher in a children's ministry, and she was quizzing these six-year-olds. She goes, what comes after Good Friday, class? What comes after Good Friday? And this precious little six-year-old girl, she put up her hand. She goes, oh, oh, teacher, after Good Friday comes Easter Sunday. And the teacher complimented her, and she says, now, Jennifer, what is that all about? And she says, well, that's when Jesus rose from the grave. That's what we celebrate. And the teacher was about to compliment her again when the little girl pushed on through, and she says, and when Jesus comes out of the grave, if he sees his shadow, then we know we're going to have seven more weeks until spring. And I just want to let you know, friends, that only part of the good news is what I would call something akin to groundhog theology. You got to know the whole truth. Jesus didn't just die on the cross, but He came out of the grave. After three days, he conquered the grave, death, hell, and he is victorious. And he he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. you got to know the whole truth. And today, we're going to push into the whole truth, knowing nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's the cross experience. So before we get into it, why don't we just pray together? Precious Holy Spirit, welcome. Welcome here. Welcome in my friend's life. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you speak to our hearts. And I just ask that you cause the seed of God's word to get deep into our heart and cause it to bring forth everlasting life and fruit. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, we try to sanitize the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the truth is, it's all about the shed blood of Jesus. And that is such an important revelation for you and I to understand. The most intimate interaction between blood and the outside world is breath. Blood gets its oxygen when your lungs perform a gas exchange with your blood. Blood is a living tissue. It's a matrix made up of liquid and solids. Did you know that? You cannot live without blood. I think you know that. The health of your physical being and your immune system is in great part measured by the health of your blood. You got red blood cells, you got white blood cells, and all those and other other important nutrient levels, your oxygen level. The Bible says in Leviticus 17.11 that the life is in the blood. And I think you know this from your doctor, that your blood speaks, your blood talks about your health, it talks about your genetics, even your history, your great-great-grandparents. There's a lot we can know from your DNA about your history. And even more, I want to talk to you about how that blood even talks spiritually. But let's go back to the beginning of time when we have the first blood. And it all starts with Adam. At his beginning, he had no life in his blood. God formed him, Genesis 2 says, of the dust of the ground. But he was just laying there, this perfect man, until Genesis 2 verse 7 where it says, And the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Did you know that God was the first person to do CPR on mankind? Isn't that beautiful? So you and I ultimately get our blood from our great-grandpappy, great-granddad, Adam. Acts 17, verse 26, we read this. And God made from one man, one common origin, one source, one blood, 
every nation of mankind. But here's the problem. The problem is with our blood. We were born with a spiritual disease called sin. Friend, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. When they committed high treason against God, they were disloyal to God. The father of all intelligent design, they were disloyal to him and they changed fathers from Father God to the father of all lies, Satan the deceiver. Adam lost the life in his blood. I like to think of it like this. Adam lost the light in his blood. Adam, in the Hebrew language, this is what it means. The, the name Adam means first blood, first of mankind, first of human beings. But I want you to get that first title, first blood. Adam means first blood. You and I, we may look different, but our blood can be traced back to our great granddad, Adam. And therefore, tangled up in our DNA is the curse. We were born with curse in our blood. When Adam sinned, he did not fall from heaven. He was living on earth in the Garden of Eden, in paradise. He fell, Adam fell from dominion. He fell from all authority over the stuff. Adam lost his identity as a child of God and became a child of the damned. His child of God status was forsaken. He therefore lost his purpose. When you lose your identity, you lose your purpose. You lose your calling. You lose all authority and dominion over the stuff. Life gets hard when you lose dominion and authority over the stuff. How many of us know what it's like to have stuff talk to us, right? Tell us to what to do. The bills telling you what to do. The money and the snow telling you what to do. A virus telling you what to do. It's not good when you lose dominion and authority over the stuff because then the stuff begins mastering you. And it was never intended to be that way. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had mastery. They had dominion over all the stuff, not each other, but over the stuff, the elements. Adam did the very opposite of being born again. His treason against God invited Satan to curse him, invited Satan to curse all of us, all of humanity. Look at Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Cain murdered his brother Abel. And you can't blame the culture of the day. You can't blame violent video games or movies, can you? Cain got his dad's blood. It's a genetic disorder. Humanity's blood carries spiritual death in it. Physical death is a byproduct of sin, the sin disorder. Romans 3, 23. This is an important scripture to understand about life. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's like God saying that all are sinners because they don't have the glory of God in their blood anymore. They don't have that honor and glory of God. Remember, Adam and Eve, the moment they sinned, nothing seemed to change on the outside. But suddenly they were aware they were naked. Why? Because the glory and the honor of God suddenly like a light went out of their blood. They were radiant before, but suddenly they perceived they were lost. They were naked. The Bible says they were ashamed. Shame moved in suddenly. Have you ever noticed that children, they don't need to be taught how to disobey, how to sin. There was a four-year-old boy and he got in trouble with his mom. His name was Caleb. Little Caleb got in trouble and his mom said, Caleb, don't you dare set one foot outside of this house. Well, she came back into the family room a few minutes later because things were kind of quiet. She walked into the family room only to find Caleb laying outside of the house on the deck with the patio door wide open and his little feet, his little four-year-old feet on the floor in the family room. Remember what mom said? Don't you set one foot outside of this house. Isn't it amazing how even at four years old, nobody teaches us how to be creatively rebellious. Nobody teaches us how to be outside the law, but yet stay inside the law. And we spend our whole life with this sin, sad sin, unholiness problem, trying to keep our feet inside the door and trying to get what we want outside on the deck, trying to enforce our own personal autonomy, right? We want to be the God of our own life, and yet we mess it up so terribly. We need a Savior. 
Disobedience, my friend, is a symptom. Yes, sin is a problem, but it's a symptom of being lost and unholy and not having light in our blood. We have a problem with our blood. It carries a genetic code for brokenness, unholiness, disorder, a spiritual mutation, if you will, that keeps us separated from God, independently lost. We sin because we're without God, because we're in darkness. You're meant to be in a loving relationship with Heavenly Father. But God is holy. God cannot be connected with anything of sin, of disloyalty, anything of the devil. Remember Adam? Can I come back to that Hebrew meaning of the word Adam? First blood, first of mankind. Think about this. Jesus, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Jesus is called the last Adam. The last first blood. If Adam means first blood and Jesus is the last Adam, Jesus is therefore the last first blood. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus came to help us be reborn into a new blood, a new lineage, a new DNA breed of light, children of light. Beautiful. God so loved you that he came up with this amazing plan to pay your debts, my debts, and to redeem us from sin, sickness, and disease. Praise God. That is just amazing. Think about it. My friend, there is a principle for forgiveness. And what I mean by that, there has to be a price paid for true forgiveness. You know, there's such a thing in this world called unsanctioned mercy, but I'm talking about sanctified mercy where the price is actually paid and not just deferred or kicked down the, the road. We, we have a society where we like to defer payments and put things off and hopefully even through some kind of bankruptcy protection, never even have the debt paid. But God is a God of justice. He's a God who balances the scales. And he said sin has to be paid for. It's a debt that has to be paid. The wages of death, says Romans 6, 23, the wages of death of sin is death. So how can humanity get really, truly forgiveness? Because we can't have a sinner pay for sin. We can't pay sin with sin. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says this. In fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Let me say that again. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The Amplified goes on and says, neither release from sin and its guilt nor cancellation of the merited punishment. But it has to be the blood of a pure um, sinless, holy sacrifice without corruption for the price to be paid. Human blood is the most corrupt substance on earth. Anybody in the medical field will tell you it begins to corrupt, rot as soon as it meets open air. The blood of God is a spiritual vaccine, an inoculation against the curse. Yes, so how? How in all eternity can God get his perfect DNA from heaven to earth to be the sacrifice for you and me? Because we've learned without the shedding of blood, pure blood, holy blood, there can be no remission of sins, no freedom from the curse. So how does God come up with this amazing plan? I'm so glad you asked. I'm so glad because I love talking about this good news. It started with the virgin birth. Now, forgive me, but we're going to get just a little bit into biology lesson here. I mean, I just want to make sure that you understand your own amazing biology as we talk about what God did in getting his DNA from heaven all the way to the earth. Listen to this. The seed of the father carries the blood to the child. The egg or the body is supplied by the mother. The blood of the mother never never mixes with the blood of the unborn baby. The baby gets its oxygen and nutrition through the placenta. Now follow me. This is so amazing. I just It gets me excited just to talk about it. In God's genius plan to save us, He has sent a perfect Savior born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. God's seed would be the Word. Okay, remember John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God 
right? God's seed would be the word carrying God's DNA, God's blood, God's instruction, but never mixing with the woman's blood who was of the original seed of Adam. The first blood, the contaminated blood. That's what we learned, right? John 1.14, it says this, and the word Christ became flesh. The word of God, Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. Every time you hear that famous scripture, you're going to remember the word, God's seed, became flesh and dwelt among us with holy, holy blood. Jesus is the last Adam. He is born with pure blood, untainted, without the curse in it. The Holy Spirit supplied the word, which is the Father God's seed. The Virgin Mary supplied the egg, which carries all the chromosomes, the hands, the feet, the back, his body. But Mary did not contribute to the Lord's blood. No, no, no. Oh, my goodness. I know you're already following me on this. This is so beautiful. A little more biology. Just bear with me. Just a little more science here to back this up. As the baby develops in the womb, it's separated from the mother by the placenta. That's as far as the mother's blood goes. Through the process of diffusion and osmosis, nutrients and oxygen, oxygen transfer through the membrane to the child by way of the umbilical cord. Mom's blood circulates on one side of the placenta and the baby's blood circulates on the other. Never do the two bloods mingle. They're separate. This is often why the baby's blood is a different type, blood type than the mom's blood. Jesus being born of the Blessed Virgin Mary means his blood came from only one source, from God the Father. The Father. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47 says this, The first man, Adam, is from earth, earthly, made of dust. But the second man, Christ the Lord, is from heaven. Jesus, every bit man and every bit God the Son of God and the Son of Man. Does God use biological engineering? Does Him using uh, biological engineering rattle you just a little bit? Look, remember, God invented biology. So, of course, He's going to use it to get His love into your life. You may know the science of computers, but that doesn't mean you know Bill Gates. Science is discovering the how, but God is the who of original engineering and design. Christianity is not independent of science. Aren't you thankful for that? Many cosmologists believe in Christ. The stars speak of God's glory. Biology, even your laminin, speak of an intelligent designer. You know, Pam and I, a few years ago, we did a, a wonderful TV show. We were the, the hosts, and we got to interview Dr. Hugh Ross, who's an astrophysicist, an expert on integration of God's truth and science. And we were just amazed at how he would um, confirm all of the things from biology even to outer space and how it all lines up with God's word perfectly. He's a mathematician, and he would crunch the numbers and tell you how perfectly from Genesis through Revelation, God's word perfectly lines up with science. Aren't you thankful that the same God, the intelligent designer who made your life has designed a plan to save you from sin, hell, and darkness and the curse? Wow. Can you begin to see the blessedness of the intended outcome of God sending a last Adam? Jesus, God put the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. He would not have sent a second Adam except that God wanted to redeem you, to buy you back from the curse and bring you back into his original plan for the Garden of Blessing. Galatians 3, we got to go back to it again, right? Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Come on, let's just remind ourselves again. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs crucified on the cross. In order that Christ, Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come in on also all the Gentiles, so that we would all receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Jesus' blood is not just our hope over death, but it's our hope to be completely, totally redeemed. You know, the deep end of the pool is a frightening place for those who don't know how to swim. It's not that they cannot swim. It's that they don't know how to swim. Deep water terrifies those with an ignorance of the how. 
the how does it work? Death is a terror to those who don't know eternal life in Christ Jesus' blood. It's not that they can't know it. It's that they don't know it. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for what they don't know. Ignorance and refusal of the truth is humanity's greatest death trap. Many people today are angry at religion. They're angry at the church. Why? Because people want real answers, not fake stuff. They don't want religion or, or form without any power. That's not the cure. Jesus is the cure. Jesus, perfect, pure blood, is the only panacea for the sin disease. God's DNA is the only inoculation to this deadly sin disease. Again, it's not a morality issue. It's the curse. The resurrected Jesus administrates the ministry of his cleansing blood to this day. Always believe a savior who has authority to take back his life after death. That's the proof. Peter said, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He had a heavenly revelation because any other Christ, small c, could never save, forgive, heal, redeem you. Never, never, never. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Now you see why in John 3, 16, that's so important, that word begotten, because Jesus was born of the blessed Virgin Mary. He had father's blood in his DNA. So let's talk about this. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20, it talks about this term called freshly slain. I want you to understand that Jesus' blood is not like your blood. It's still moving. It's still active to this day. 2,000 years later, Jesus' blood is still alive and moving. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 20 say this, we have confidence that we can enter the holy place by means of Jesus' blood through a new, look at that word new, through a new and living way that he opened up for us through the veil, which is his body. Remember, Jesus' body was torn, cut open, broke open his back. And the Bible calls his body like a veil that we have access into the holy of holies through the veil of his flesh through his body. The word new is from the Greek word prosphatos, means freshly slain, newly slain. Jesus' blood is newly slain right at this very second. It doesn't coagulate. It doesn't scab over. It doesn't corrupt. Jesus' blood is flowing today, even in the heavenlies, purifying and making everything holy. Jesus' blood is newly slain. His blood is never old or corrupted or contaminated. Acts 13 verse 35 says, For this reason, he also says in another psalm, You will not allow your Holy One to see decay. Look, God prophesied this about his son's blood. Our blood begins to decompose the moment it's released into the air. The culture of divine life was encapsulated inside the body of Christ. Oh, God sent his kingdom to earth inside the body of Christ through his DNA, but then it was broken for us. His body was broken. Every time we celebrate communion, we celebrate the broken body of Christ. Why? Because when his body was broken, out of it flowed his pure blood and it's carrying eternal life. And through the brokenness of his body, we have access into the holy of holies. Released into the atmosphere for all of us is the blood of Jesus. So so now something we talked about earlier, the blood speaks. It always talks. It's always communicating biologically. Yes, but spiritually, even in more importantly, the blood talks. Did you know that Abel's blood? Remember, we talked about Cain murdering his brother Abel. Abel's blood still cries out for vengeance to this day. Jesus blood cries out for mercy, forgiveness, life. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, uniting God and man, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of mercy, Jesus' sprinkled blood, speaking of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than what? The blood of who? Abel, which cries out for vengeance. Still, Jesus did not have corrupt Adamic blood. Therefore, his blood, his blood is constantly speaking a better, more beautiful message of redemption. You might say, well, Abel was innocent. Cain killed Abel, but Abel was still born of Adam's blood, so it was corrupt. And notice to this day, Abel's blood doesn't cry out for forgiveness, cries out for vengeance. 
Jesus' pure blood has no corruption, no death, no decay, and zero condemnation. Yes, there are natural compounds in Jesus' blood. He's got the red and the white blood cells, oxygen, but there is also a supernatural cleansing, life-giving power. Jesus' blood has the power to cleanse us, the power that is in that blood to take away all sin. Ever since Calvary, where Jesus at the cross was slain, where Jesus' blood was released into the world's atmosphere, eternal life has been within the reach of every person on planet Earth. God's love within the reach of every person. How? By the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the perfect sacrifice, Jesus. You know that old hymn, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's why we sing that song. That's why it's so powerful and so anointed and such a, has such a sound of deliverance in every note. God is a very real justice-minded God. So let me escort you right now into this spiritual courtroom because God is so justice minded. And on one side over here on my left hand side is the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says, the enemy himself waiting to accuse you for every sin you've ever done, every mistake you've ever made. On this side is Jesus, our counselor, with the nail prints in his hands. Father God is the judge and Holy Spirit is running all the proceeding. Now notice, Jesus is very courtroom conscious, right? Remember, he didn't give an answer to the Pharisees and the Sadducees when they brought him before the high priest court. Why? Because he's the king dying as the king of a kingdom. He's not a religious figure. They had him in the wrong court. They had him in a religious court. He didn't answer until he came before Pontius Pilate because he was in a kingdom court then. And when Pontius asked him and he said, hey, are you the king of the Jews? He said, yes, you've, you've asked correctly. I am the king of the Jews. Jesus is very courtroom minded. He's a justice minded God. Only a king can appoint. Jesus went after death on your and my behalf and he didn't avoid it. He wasn't trying to get away from the cross. He per intentionally, purposefully went after the cross. We are a were appointed to death and so our king took our appointment for us. Isn't that beautiful? So here we are in our courtroom. And I have to ask you, which side of the courtroom do you want to be on? You've got the accuser over here, but you've got your counselor. And all you have to do when they ask, are you guilty? When the accuser says, you know, Stephen's guilty of this sin. Stephen is guilty of that thought. Stephen is guilty of this crime. Stephen is guilty of this sin, of this iniquity. Stephen is guilty. Every time the accuser accuses me, I look to my counselor, Jesus. And Jesus says, Plead the blood, son. Plead the blood. Before the Father, plead the blood. So guess what I do? I plead the blood of Jesus. Every time an accusation, I say, but the blood of Jesus. And every time he accuses me, on this side, I've got Jesus, my lawyer. Jesus, my counselor. Jesus interceding for me. That's what it means. Jesus at the right hand of the Father interceding for me, saying, Father, mercy, mercy, mercy. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they sided on the accuser's side. They rejected the life of Jesus. Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, went to that side of the courtroom and he went to the wrong side of the courtroom. Look, I was appointed for death, but Jesus went to war against death, stood in my place, shed his blood, laid down his life. He could have called 12 legions of angels at any second, but Jesus stayed the course. Jesus died in my place, taking sin, hell, and death for me. John 10, 18 says, no one takes it away from me. Jesus said, but I lay it down and I have the power to take it back again. Nobody goes to hell because of their sin. People go to hell for rejecting Jesus' blood in the courtroom of God's proceedings. Jesus' blood as a ransom for their sin. Jesus has conquered sin, death, and hell, but you've got to receive the price he's paid. If you reject it, 
There is no other name by which you can be saved. John 1, 12, but to as many as did receive Jesus, to them God has given the power, the right, and the privilege to be called the children of God, those that believe in his name. When you receive Jesus, you receive the finished work at the cross. You get his shed blood at the cross. You become perfect, the righteousness of God. At the cross, we lay down all of our sin, all of our failure at the cross, and we receive the full price, the redemptive work of Jesus at the cross. And his blood's constantly crying out, mercy. What would you plead today? Would you go to that side? Would you just come up with all kinds of excuses with the accuser? Would you try to fight accusations with excuses and lies? That's trying to overcome sin with sin. But on this side of the court, you have a just counselor who gives you his blood. And he says, plead my blood. The father likes my blood. Plead my DNA. When you receive Jesus, you received his finished work at the cross. So how do we overcome? How do we get from our broken state into a holy state? How do we get from being unrighteous to becoming the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Revelation 12, 11 says this, they overcame the enemy, the accuser, this guy over here, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Jesus is supplying the blood. You and I, we just have to confess and believe on our savior and say, I plead the blood of Jesus. When you're a child of God, the courtroom of justice works for you. Judgment is not something to be afraid of, but you want the gavel of the father to come down and say, ah, judgment is for my child. Yeah, judgment is for my child. Let give him the remuneration. Give him the blessing that my son Jesus paid for. Give her the blessing, the forgiveness, the redemptive work that my son paid for. Gavel coming down. Judgment is for my daughter, for my son, for my family. My goodness, it's so beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Look, if you've never prayed this prayer and never invited Jesus to be your counselor and to intercede for you, you can pray this prayer right now. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to your cross. I surrender all of my life. You died in my place. I repent of my wrongdoing. Forgive me. Cleanse me. You conquered the powers of darkness. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Now help me, Lord, to live for you. In your precious name, amen.